As Niran stared at Captain John Allen with disgusted yellow eyes, he didn't realize humans would thrust their mating parts into any alien holes, whether the aliens wanted it or not. John's survey ship, Bucephalus, descended through the swirling purple clouds of Zephon 6, carefully navigating the turbulent atmosphere. His five crew members checked scanning equipment and steered thrusters, while John gazed out the front viewport at the approaching Gamelon capital city. Soaring chrome towers gleamed under the red giant sun. The humans needed to establish diplomatic relations with the natives here. If they failed, Earth's dwindling population would starve without new agricultural worlds to replace those destroyed in the Centauri Wars. John clenched his fists. One way or another, humanity would spread its seed across the cosmos, planting itself in the fertile soils of countless alien worlds. John stomped back onto the Bucephalus, steam practically shooting from his ears. He called an emergency meeting of his senior officers in the conference room. They needed to figure out how to handle this disastrous first contact with the Gamelons. Can you believe the nerve of those stuck-up prudes? John fumed, pacing in front of the viewscreen showing the sprawling alien city below. Acting like we're some kind of deviants for expressing natural male needs. What a backward species. Mike Donnelly, John's barrel-chested first officer, let out a hearty guffaw. He leaned back in his chair, hands behind his head. They don't know what they're missing, Captain. Poor repressed bastards. I guarantee behind closed doors they're just as horny as any human. I doubt that, John said, shaking his head. Did you see the look on Emperor Niran's face? He couldn't get us off his planet fast enough. A sly grin spread across Mike's stubbly face. Care to put your money where your mouth is, sir? I bet 100 credits that by the time we pull out of orbit, some curious Gamelon youth will be begging to ride the human rocket, if you catch my drift. Want a shake on it? John hesitated for a moment, then reached out to clasp Mike's beefy hand. You're on, Commander, but I'll be shocked if any Gamelon so much as makes eye contact with us after that imperial decree forbidding fraternization. Mike winked. Never underestimate the allure of the exotic and forbidden, boss. Mark my words, we'll have no shortage of young alien nookie before all's said and done. John was about to retort when the communications panel beeped. Ensign Rodriguez's voice crackled over the speaker. Captain to the bridge, we have an incoming hail from the planet's surface. It's an unusual request, sir. Raising an eyebrow, John strode onto the bridge, Mike at his heels. On the main screen, a youthful purple-skinned Gamelon regarded him nervously. Greetings, Captain Allen. I am Kyleth, first son of Clan Morvok. I have been selected to lead a delegation of young people in a cultural exchange with your crew. We wish to learn more about your species and customs. May we come aboard your vessel? John blinked in surprise. This was the last thing he expected, after basically being told to piss off by the Gamelon Emperor. He glanced over at Mike, who flashed him a shit-eating grin and rubbed his fingers together in the universal sign for money. Sighing, John turned back to Kyleth. We would be honoured to host you and your delegation. I will have my men prepare accommodations and an educational programme. We launch a shuttle to collect you in one standard hour. As the viewscreen went blank, Mike elbowed John in the ribs. Told you, didn't I? Those purple bastards can't resist the allure of human cock. Time to go replicate some rubbers, eh, sir? John could only shake his head as he ordered his crew to begin preparations for receiving the Gamelon youths. He had a sinking feeling this cultural exchange would be a thinly veiled excuse for the alien kids to get their rocks off with some exotic human strange. The shuttle arrived, and a gaggle of giggling, wide-eyed Gamelon adolescents spilled out, craning their necks to ogle everything and everyone. They crowded around the human men, boldly reaching out to touch their uniforms and exposed skin. John's diplomatic crew smiled politely but looked overwhelmed. Over the next few days, John noticed the Gamelon visitors spent more time batting their lashes at his men than studying human history or culture. They asked very personal questions and accidentally brushed up against the humans at every opportunity. The entire ship was abuzz with scuttlebutt, about clandestine language lessons and biology tutorials between the two species. 
Try as he might to keep things professional, John had to admit Mike was right. The Gamelon youth were definitely sniffing after some human sausage. Frustrated, he could only watch his credits trickling away as the rumours of interspecies hookups spread like wildfire. So much for the Emperor's non-fraternisation decree. John was in the middle of reviewing crew performance reports when the door to his ready room burst open. Emperor Niran stormed in, his purple face flushed with rage. Captain Allen, I demand an explanation for the depraved behaviour of your men. Niran slammed his fist on John's desk, sending pads clattering to the floor. John rose from his chair, holding up his hands in a placating gesture. Emperor Niran, please calm down. What seems to be the problem? The problem, Niran seethed, is that your perverted crew has been defiling our innocent youth. Rumours are spreading like wildfire about secret trysts and private lessons between humans and gamelons. This is an outrage. John took a deep breath, choosing his words carefully. I assure you any interactions between my crew and your people have been entirely consensual. We have no intention of disrespecting Gamelon laws or customs. Niran jabbed a finger at John's chest. Consensual. They are children, easily impressionable. You humans have filled their heads with degenerate ideas, corrupting them with your loose morals. This ends now, Captain. If I hear of one more incident, I will have your entire ship expelled from Gamelon space. Am I clear? Crystal, John replied through gritted teeth, you have my word that my crew will be on their best behaviour. Niran snorted derisively. See that they are. The purity of our species depends on it. With that, the Emperor spun on his heel and marched out. John slumped back into his chair, massaging his temples. This mission was turning into a diplomatic nightmare. As he contemplated his next move, the door chime sounded. Cass, he called wearily. A young Gamelon male shuffled in head bowed and shoulders hunched. Captain Allen, I am Zorak, son of Clan Kyvak. May I have a word in private? John gestured for him to sit. Of course, Zorak, what's on your mind? Zorak fidgeted, unable to meet John's gaze. I, I am one of the youths who has been intimate with your crewmen. John leaned forward, clasping his hands on the desk. I see. And you're telling me this because... Because I don't want you to leave, Zorak blurted out. Captain, there are many of us who are fascinated by humans, drawn to your confidence and openness. We yearn to explore new possibilities, to challenge the rigid thinking of our elders. But we are afraid to speak out against traditionalists like Niran. John pinched the bridge of his nose. As much as he sympathized with Zorak's plight, he had a mission to complete and a crew to protect. Getting embroiled in Gamelon cultural upheaval was not part of the plan. Zorak, he began gently, I appreciate your honesty, but you must understand I have to respect the wishes of your government. I can't undermine their authority, even if I disagree with their stance. Tears welled in Zorak's amber eyes. So you're just going to abandon us? Leave us trapped under Niran's oppressive rule while you fly away to the stars? A pang of guilt stabbed at John's heart. This whole situation was a mess. On one hand, the Gamelon youths deserved the freedom to make their own choices. His crew had every right to pursue consensual relationships. But on the other hand, openly defying Niran could jeopardize the entire mission and Earth's chances of finding new agricultural colonies. John rubbed his jaw, feeling the weight of command pressing down on him. What was the right call? uphold Gamelon law and crush the dreams of their youth, or stand up for his crew's autonomy and risk an interstellar incident. John paced in his quarters, mind racing. He couldn't let this cultural misunderstanding jeopardize the mission or the futures of those hopeful Gamelon youths. It was time for a frank discussion with Niran, leader to leader. He sent a message requesting a private audience. In the Emperor's opulent receiving room, John faced Niran. The Gamelon leader sat stiffly on his throne, eyes hard. John took a deep breath and dove in. Emperor Niran, I must speak candidly. My crew and I will not be bullied or shamed for our natural desires and attractions. Your youth are adults, capable of choosing their own partners, regardless of species. Niran's nostrils flared. 
Absurd! Gamelons have remained pure for generations. We will not sully our bloodlines by mixing with humans. John leaned forward. With respect, genetic diversity is a strength, not a weakness. Your isolationist views are holding your society back. Embracing change and connection with others can only enrich Gamelon culture. Niran surged to his feet. I will not be lectured by you, Captain. Our traditions are sacrosanct. Gamelons belong with Gamelons alone. That is the natural order. Just then the door burst open. Niran's son Tarok stormed in, amber eyes blazing. No, father, you're wrong. I have taken a human as my lover. I refuse to live a lie any more. Niran reeled back as if slapped. Tarok, what madness is this? You would defy me, defile yourself? I forbid it. Tarok drew himself up proudly. I denounce your intolerance. I'm leaving Zephon Six to explore the cosmos with my love. And I'm not the only one. More will follow, seeking to expand their horizons. As Niran sputtered in shock, John stepped between them. This is what I'm trying to make you understand, Niran. Love knows no boundaries. You can't control the heart. Let them follow their bliss. Niran collapsed heavily onto his throne, a defeated tyrant. John and Tarok exchanged a look of solidarity, united in their determination to forge a more open, accepting path. There was still much work to be done. Niran slumped onto his throne, head in his hands, as Tarok's words rang in his ears. His own son, his flesh and blood, confessing to laying with a human? Unthinkable. Yet, here they were. John stepped forward, hands outstretched in a conciliatory gesture. Emperor Niran, I understand this is a shock, but perhaps we can find a middle ground, a compromise to satisfy both our peoples. Niran looked up, eyes narrowed. Speak then, human, what do you propose? John cleared his throat. My crew and I will fully abide by your laws during our time on Zephon Six. No more fraternization, you have my word, but... He paused, choosing his next words carefully. Any of your people who wish to leave, to seek companionship among the stars, I grant them the freedom to do so, without judgment or retribution. Niran's fists clenched, knuckles whitening. Every fibre of his being screamed to refuse, to reassert the old ways. But Tarok, his beloved boy, could he really condemn him to a life of secrecy and shame? As Niran wrestled with indecision, whispers began to race through the palace halls. Tarok's defiant declaration spread like wildfire, igniting long-suppressed dreams and desires. Gamelon youths gathered in the streets, at first in small knots, then growing crowds. They shouted Tarok's name, raised signs calling for change. Many stepped forward to proclaim their forbidden human lovers, casting off generations of ingrained xenophobia. The most daring marched to the spaceport, boarding human vessels and demanding passage off-world. Niran watched the feeds in growing dismay. His society was unravelling before his eyes. And for what? Alien passions? Misplaced idealism? No, he realised with sinking dread. A future he could no longer deny. His people clamoured for the stars. With a heavy heart, Niran called for a planet-wide broadcast. He faced the cameras, suddenly feeling every one of his long years. My fellow Gamelons, he began, voice grave, I come before you in a time of great change, of upheaval to our most cherished traditions. He took a shuddering breath, steeling himself. While I cannot condone the mixing of our species, I must accept the reality that many of you desire companionship with these humans. Therefore I decree that any adult Gamelon who freely chooses to leave Zephon Six and pursue such a union may do so, without fear of punishment or exile. Gasps and mutters rippled through the crowds, disbelief warring with elation. Niran raised a hand for silence. I do this not to spur the collapse of our ways, but to forestall it. We cannot maintain our isolation and expect our youth to stay, to uphold values they no longer share. So I must bend or see us break. He turned to John, meeting the human's gaze. Captain Allen, I propose we open formal diplomatic relations between our worlds, 
to discuss trade, cultural exchange, and the emigration of any Gamelans who wish to join your people among the stars. Much as it pains me, I recognize that change has come to Zephon VI. I must put my people first, even if means accepting a future I do not understand. John nodded solemnly, recognizing the Emperor's anguish and resolve. They shook hands, an interspecies accord born of necessity and the undeniable tides of progress, the course of two civilizations now irrevocably intertwined. John rubbed his temples as he left the negotiation room, frustration etched on his face. Just when it seemed like progress was being made, a new obstacle had emerged. Zorak, a die-hard traditionalist, was stirring up trouble among the Gamelons. He and his followers were determined to resist any change, viewing the budding relationships between humans and Gamelons as a perversion of their society. Reports started trickling in of harassment and violence against mixed couples. Gamelons who dared to associate with humans were labelled as traitors, facing intimidation and threats from Zorak's gang. The rhetoric grew more heated by the day, with Zorak openly calling for the expulsion of all humans from Zephon VI. John paced in his quarters, the latest incident reports scattered across his desk. A young gamelan named Thraz had been beaten badly for holding hands with a human crewman in public. The crewman, Ensign Davis, was also injured when he tried to intervene. John slammed his fist on the table, anger boiling in his veins. He stormed into Niran's office, interrupting the Emperor's meeting with his advisers. Niran, this has gone too far. You need to put a stop to Zorak and his thugs before someone gets killed. Niran sighed heavily, the weight of his position evident in the slump of his shoulders. Captain, I share your concerns, but I cannot be seen as a tyrant, silencing dissent among my own people. It will only breed more resentment and resistance. John leaned forward, locking eyes with the Emperor. And what about the safety of your citizens? The humans and Gamelons who just want to live in peace, to love who they choose. You have a duty to protect them. Niran broke eye contact, his gaze distant. I fear that any action I take will only further divide us. Zorak has more support than I'd like to admit. Cracking down on him could push more Gamelons to his cause. John stood, jaw clenched. Then you leave me no choice. If you won't act, I will. I won't stand by and watch innocent people be terrorized. He left Niran's office, a plan already forming in his mind. He reached out to Tarok and some of the other Gamelon youths who had been vocal in their support of human Gamelon relations. They met in secret, in a dimly lit cargo bay on the outskirts of the city. We can't let Zorak and his fanatics win, John said, addressing the small group. They're spreading fear and hate, trying to tear apart the progress we've made. But we can fight back, not with violence but with unity and protection. Tarok nodded, determination blazing in his amber eyes. My friends and I, we're ready to stand up for what's right, for the future we believe in. What do you need us to do, Captain? John laid out his plan. They would form a network, a coalition of humans and gamelons dedicated to safeguarding targeted couples. They would provide escorts, safe houses, and a support system for those facing threats and they would counter Zorak's hateful rhetoric with a message of tolerance, understanding, and the strength that comes from diversity. As the group dispersed, ready to put the plan into action, John felt a flicker of hope amid the chaos. Change was never easy, and there would always be those who resisted progress. But as long as there were brave souls willing to stand together to fight for love and acceptance, they could weather any storm. The battle for Zephon VI's future had only just begun. The blaring of alarms jolted John from his bunk. Red emergency lights flashed as he stumbled to the bridge, heart pounding. The view screen showed a nightmarish scene, a mob of armed gamelons swarming the ship's perimeter, hurling firebombs and firing plasma rifles. At their head was Zorak, face contorted with rage as he screamed for the humans to leave or die. John barked orders to his security teams to repel the attackers, he opened a comm channel to Niran, yelling over the chaos. Niran, are you seeing this? Zorak has lost his mind. The Emperor's voice crackled back, strained with disbelief. I... I see it, John. This is madness. I'm sending my guards to assist you immediately. 
The ship rocked as an explosion blasted a hole in the hull. Engineers scrambled to contain the breach. John grabbed a rifle and raced to join the defense, praying they could hold out until help arrived. In the midst of the fighting, a blood-curdling scream rang out. John whipped around to see Tarok crumpled on the ground, seared by a plasma bolt as he shielded Ensign Davis from the shot. The human crewman cradled Tarok in his arms, pleading for a medic. The extremists fell back under the combined assault of the human security force and Niran's guards. The injured were rushed to Medbay, Tarok among them. John sagged against a bulkhead, his uniform singed and sweat-soaked. They had repelled the attack, but at what cost? He found Niran standing on the battle-scarred landing pad, face ashen as he surveyed the destruction. The Emperor clenched his fists, voice shaking with anger. Zorak has gone too far. Attacking our guests, harming my son. This is unforgivable. I was a fool to let it come to this. Niran turned to John, eyes hardening with resolve. No more half-measures, Captain. Zorak and his band of fanatics are a cancer on Gamelon society. They must be rooted out and brought to justice. I will not let their hatred poison our world any longer. He raised his voice, addressing the gathered crowd of humans and Gamelons. Hear me now. Zorak and all who follow him are enemies of the state. I will not rest until they are captured and punished for their crimes against our people and our honored guests. Let it be known that Gamelons will not be ruled by fear and intolerance. The onlookers erupted into cheers, Gamelons and humans alike rallying behind their leader's declaration. John nodded grimly, placing a hand on Niran's shoulder. We're with you, Emperor. My crew will provide any assistance you need to track down Zorak. We'll show him that unity is stronger than division, and... As medics updated them on Tarok's stable but critical condition, John and Niran began planning their next move. They pored over intelligence reports and eyewitness accounts, determined to flush Zorak out of hiding. After days of tireless efforts, they finally received a credible tip. Zorak had been spotted at an abandoned mining complex in the northern wastes. John gathered his most trusted officers, while Niran mustered an elite strike team. Together, they set out to bring the extremist to justice. They stormed the mining facility, quickly overpowering Zorak's surprised sentries. The human Gamelon force pressed forward, following the sounds of shouted orders and fleeing footsteps. They burst into the central chamber to find Zorak and his lieutenants hastily arming themselves backed into a corner. Niran stepped forward, his rifle trained on Zorak's chest. It's over, Zorak. Lay down your weapons and surrender peacefully. Enough blood has been spilled in the name of your misguided cause. The extremist leader sneered, hatred twisting his features. Misguided. I'm trying to save our species from contamination, from being weakened and diluted by these alien invaders, consorting with humans, polluting our proud bloodlines. You're the traitor here, not me. Niran shook his head sadly. I once thought as you did, Zorak, but I was wrong. Isolating ourselves, clinging to outdated prejudices, that is the true threat to our people. The humans offer us a chance to grow, to evolve as a society. Why can't you see that? Zorak spat on the ground. Growth, evolution, lies and perversions. I will never submit to the alien taint. I would rather die than see Gamelons debase themselves with these ape-descended degenerates. He raised his rifle defiantly, prepared to make his final stand. John and the others tensed, fingers on triggers, ready for the extremists' next move. Zorak's eyes blazed with fanatical hatred as he reached into his tattered robes. He pulled out a small cobbled-together plasma pistol, its barrel glowing an ominous blue. Before anyone could react, Zorak leveled the weapon at Niran's chest. "'You're no leader, Niran. You're a traitor to your own kind,' Zorak snarled, his finger tightening on the trigger. Selling us out to these alien scum, letting them defile our people, I won't allow it. The world seemed to slow as Zorak fired, the plasma bolt streaking toward the stunned Emperor. But John was already moving, lunging forward to shield Niran with his own body. The searing plasma slammed into John's side, sending him crashing to the ground in a smouldering heap.
Chaos erupted as the human crew and Gamelon guards opened fire, their combined onslaught dropping Zorak and his extremists in a hail of blaster bolts. The acrid stench of ozone and burned flesh filled the air. Niran stood frozen, staring at John's unmoving form. Slowly he knelt beside the fallen human, gently turning him over. John groaned, his uniform charred and bloody where the plasma had struck. Why? Niran whispered, his voice hoarse with shock. Why would you do that? Why risk your life for me? John managed a pained smile. Because it was the right thing to do. Because I believe in a future where our people stand together, not divided by hate. Medics rushed in, carefully lifting John onto a stretcher. As they carried him away, Niran felt a profound shift within himself. He had witnessed firsthand the depth of human compassion, the willingness to sacrifice for others regardless of species. It was a quality he had not expected, a strength of character that humbled him. In the days that followed, as John recovered in the survey ship's medical bay, Niran spent long hours in contemplation. He reflected on the events that had brought them to this point, the fear and prejudice that had nearly torn their societies apart, and the bravery of those who had fought to bring them together. At last, Niran knew what he had to do. He called for a planet-wide address standing tall before his people. My fellow Gamelons, he began, his voice ringing with newfound conviction. Today, we stand at a crossroads. We can cling to the old ways, letting fear and hatred guide us, or we can choose a new path, one of openness and unity. He paused, letting his words sink in. I have seen the true nature of these humans, the courage and compassion that lies within them, and I have seen the same qualities in those of you who have dared to love across the boundaries of species. Niran took a deep breath, preparing himself for the momentous declaration. Therefore I decree that from this day forward, all Gamelons shall be free to choose their own mates, regardless of whether they be Gamelon or human. We will no longer be shackled by outdated traditions, but will embrace the strength that comes from diversity and acceptance. A hush fell over the crowd, broken by scattered gasps and murmurs. Then a roar of approval erupted from the assembled Gamelon youth, their cheers echoing through the streets. Some of the older Gamelons looked uncertain, even disapproving, but they held their tongues unwilling to challenge the Emperor's proclamation. Niran raised his hands, calling for quiet. Change is never easy, he acknowledged, and there will be challenges ahead. But I believe that by opening our hearts and minds, by embracing the best of both our species, we will build a stronger, more vibrant Gamelon society. As the speech ended and the crowds began to disperse, Niran felt a sense of hope for the future. There was still much work to be done, wounds to heal, and bridges to build. But with the humans as their allies and partners, he knew that a new era of peace and prosperity lay ahead. And through it all, the bond between Niran and John would stand as a symbol of what could be achieved when two worlds, two peoples, learn to understand and respect one another. The once bitter adversaries had become the unlikeliest of friends, their shared experience forging a connection that would help guide their people toward a brighter tomorrow. John sat up in his hospital bed, wincing as the movement pulled at his healing wound. The medbay door slid open, and Tarok entered, followed by a group of young Gamelons. John recognized some of them from the protests and the battle against Zorak's extremists. Tarok approached the bedside, his amber eyes filled with a mix of gratitude and determination. Captain, I know you're still recovering, but we needed to speak with you before you leave Zephon 6, Tarok said. What you did for us, for our people, it's changed everything. You've shown us that there's so much more to the universe than our narrow traditions. John smiled, touched by the young Gamelon's words. I'm just glad I could help, Tarok. Your generation has the power to build a better future for Zephon VI. A female Gamelon stepped forward, her voice trembling with emotion. But it's not just about Zephon VI anymore, Captain. There are so many other worlds out there, so many species still trapped by prejudice and fear. We want to spread the message of unity and acceptance across the galaxy, just like you did here. 
John sat up straighter, his interest piqued. What are you proposing? Tarok exchanged glances with his companions before speaking. We want you to be an ambassador for interspecies understanding, Captain. You've seen firsthand how love and compassion can triumph over hate. We need your help to bring that message to other worlds. John was silent for a moment, considering the magnitude of the request. It was a daunting task, but also an incredible opportunity. He thought of all the species he had encountered in his travels, the countless worlds still isolated by fear and mistrust. If he could make even a small difference... I'll do it, John said, his voice filled with conviction. I'll be your ambassador, but I can't do it alone. I'll need a crew, a team of individuals committed to this cause, both human and gamelon. Tarok grinned, his face lighting up with excitement. You'll have them, Captain. There are plenty of us ready to stand with you to explore the stars and build bridges between our peoples. Over the next few days, as John recovered, he worked with Tarok and Niran to assemble his new crew. They selected individuals from both species who shared their vision of a more connected, accepting galaxy. There were scientists and diplomats, soldiers and healers, all united by a common purpose. When the day of departure finally arrived, John stood on the landing pad, his crew assembled behind him. Niran was there to see them off, his face a mix of pride and trepidation. The Emperor clasped John's hand, his grip firm. Take care out there, John, Niran said. You're embarking on a difficult journey, but a vital one. Know that you have my support and the gratitude of the Gamelin people. John nodded, his eyes shining with determination. Thank you, Niran, for everything. I promise we'll make you proud. As the ship lifted off, John looked out at the stars, the vast expanse of the galaxy stretching before them. He knew there would be challenges ahead, species who might resist their message. But he also knew that change was possible, that love and understanding could flourish in the most unexpected places. On the first leg of their journey, John and his crew encountered a species known as the Virix, a race of insectoid beings fiercely protective of their hive culture. The Virix were initially wary of the mixed human Gamelon crew, viewing them as a potential threat to their way of life. But through a series of carefully negotiated meetings and cultural exchanges, John began to break down the barriers. He shared stories of the transformation on Zephon 6, of how embracing diversity had strengthened their society. Slowly, the Virix began to open up, their curiosity overcoming their fear. One evening, as John walked through the Virix capital, he stumbled upon a surprising sight. A human crew member, a young woman named Lena, was engaged in an intimate conversation with a Virix drone. The two were huddled close, their body language speaking of a deep connection that transcended species. John smiled to himself, seeing in their interaction a glimmer of the change he hoped to inspire. It would take time and there would be setbacks along the way, but with each world they visited, each heart they touched, John knew they were one step closer to a galaxy where love knew no boundaries. Back on Zephon 6, Niran watched as his world continued to change. Mixed couples walked hand in hand through the streets, no longer fearing persecution or judgment. A new generation of Gamelons was growing up, one that valued compassion and openness over rigid tradition. Niran himself had begun to forge an unlikely friendship with a human diplomat named Samuel. The two men spent long hours in discussion, sharing their experiences as leaders, navigating times of great change. Samuel's insights and understanding helped Niran to see his own journey in a new light, to recognize the strength that came from embracing the unknown. As Niran looked out over his transformed society, he felt a sense of hope for the future. The road ahead would not be easy, but with the example set by John and his crew, he knew that anything was possible. The galaxy was vast and filled with wonders, and Niran was determined to ensure that his people would face it with open hearts and minds. The distress beacon pulsed on the viewscreen, its urgent rhythm filling the bridge with a sense of foreboding. John leaned forward in his chair, his brow furrowed. 
Lena, what do we know about this planet? The science officer consulted her display. Zorgon Prime dominant species, Zorgons, humanoid but with a strict caste system based on genetic purity, isolated, not much contact with the Federation. John exchanged a glance with Tarok, who stood at his side. Sounds like they might not take kindly to a mixed crew like ours. Tarok placed a hand on John's shoulder. All the more reason to help, Captain. If they're facing unrest over interspecies issues, perhaps our presence can make a difference. John nodded, his resolve hardening. Helm set a course. Let's see what we're dealing with. As they entered orbit, the extent of the conflict became clear. The planet was a patchwork of smoking cities and cratered battlefields. Desperate communications filled the airwaves, pleading for aid. John turned to his comm officer. Open a channel, all frequencies. This is Captain John Harmon of the Federation Starship Endeavour. We're here to help, to provide humanitarian aid and mediation if requested. There was a tense pause. Then a haggard face appeared on the screen. I am Chancellor Zorak of the Zorgan High Council. Your assistance is welcome, Captain, but I must warn you, our society is deeply divided. Your mixed crew may face hostility from certain factions. John met Zorak's gaze steadily. We're prepared for that, Chancellor. My crew believes in the power of unity and understanding. We'll do whatever we can to help your people find a peaceful resolution. Over the next few days, John and his team worked tirelessly to set up refugee camps and distribute supplies. They met with leaders from both sides of the conflict, trying to find common ground. Tarok, in particular, spent long hours with Zorgon couples who had dared to love across caste lines, sharing his own story of defying tradition for the sake of love. But the tensions only seemed to escalate, fanned by extremists who saw the Federation presence as a threat. One evening, as John and Tarok were escorting a group of mixed-caste couples to a secure location, they found themselves surrounded by an angry mob. Abominations! the rioters shouted, hurling stones and debris. You defile our purity with your perversions! John and his security team formed a protective cordon, but the mob kept pressing forward. Tarok pushed his way to the front, his hands raised in a gesture of peace. Please listen to me, he cried. Genetic diversity is not a weakness, but a strength. I implore you, do not let hate and fear blind you to the beauty of love in all its forms. For a moment it seemed his words might break through. But then a figure emerged from the crowd, a jagged blade in hand. With a snarl of rage, the extremist lunged at Tarok, driving the knife into his chest. Time seemed to freeze as Tarok crumpled to the ground, his blood staining the earth. John let out a wordless cry of anguish, cradling his lover's body as the security team drove back the attackers. In the days that followed, as Tarok's life slipped away in the ship's medbay, John was forced to confront a bitter truth. For all the progress they had made, there were still those who clung to hatred, who would lash out in violence rather than embrace change. With a heavy heart, John made the decision to evacuate as many mixed-caste couples as they could. The Federation could offer them asylum, a chance at a new life, free from persecution. But for Zorgan Prime itself, the future looked bleak. As the last shuttle lifted off, John stood on the bridge, his eyes fixed on the planet below. Lena approached him cautiously, her voice soft. Captain, I'm so sorry about Tarok. I know how much he meant to you, to all of us. John nodded, his throat tight. He believed in our mission, in the power of love to overcome any obstacle. I won't let his sacrifice be in vain. He turned to face his crew, his gaze resolute. We'll keep fighting, keep spreading the message of unity and acceptance, no matter how long it takes, no matter the cost. For Tarok, and for all those who dare to love across the boundaries of species. The journey back to Zephon 6 was somber, each member of the crew lost in their own thoughts. As they entered orbit, Niran's face appeared on the viewscreen, etched with grief. John, I heard about Tarok. I'm so sorry, he was a true hero, a shining example of the best of our people. John managed a wan smile. Thank you, Niran. He loved you and your world so much. He wanted nothing more than to see Zephon 6 thrive in diversity and acceptance. 
The funeral was a simple affair. Tarok's body laid to rest in a quiet glade outside the capital. As John stood at the graveside, flanked by Niran and Samuel, he felt the weight of his loss, mingled with a fierce determination. Tarok gave his life for our cause, he said softly, his hand resting on the freshly turned earth. I won't let that be in vain. I'll keep fighting, keep pushing for change, for as long as it takes. Niran clasped John's shoulder, his eyes shining with unshed tears. And we will be with you every step of the way. Tarok's legacy will live on, through the bonds of friendship and love that we forge across the stars. As the sun began to set, casting long shadows across the glade, John took a deep breath. The road ahead would be hard, marred by setbacks and heartbreak. But he knew, with a bone-deep certainty, that it was a road worth travelling. For Tarok, for the countless souls yearning to love freely, he would press on. With a final nod to Niran and Samuel, John turned and strode back to his ship, his crew falling into step behind him. The endeavour lifted off, its hull gleaming in the fading light, ready to face whatever challenges the galaxy had in store. The fight for love and unity would continue, no matter the odds. You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel, and for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.